Okay, so now let's talk about the red wine making process. Hopefully you felt good about last week's white wine making episode, although I did completely forget to um, include the links I promised for the optical sorters. So to make it up to you this week, I'm including four links, right? Quantity, quality, whatever. Um, and I have little descriptions so you'll understand why I'm sharing each of them. As you will see in the videos, the optical sorter can be used with all grape colors. In fact, a lot of the decisions for red and white wine really are analogous. Um, Winemakers will once again have to decide what sort of canopy management to do, when to pick the grapes, the choice between machine and hand harvesting, etc. Of course, the answers to the questions will be different because the grapes are different. Like the questions themselves and the dilemmas that the winemakers face um, are very similar. So note, we are not yet to the point of discussing like where in the vineyard you might be planting one variety versus another, or how the slope affects the ripening of the grapes, which grapes ripen earlier than others. Um, like Cab is a late ripening grape, um, ripening grape. I think we did discuss that in the Cab video. And all of the other extensive choices that go into viticulture. I remember someone once said that winemakers are just farmers and it was said with this like condescension so it's kind of true, winemakers are largely farmers, but there's so much that goes into farming, it's insane. Like in a book I'm reading right now, they said, I, someone calculated it, and there are 3,000 choices that go into winemaking, which I didn't do the math. Um, but the point is never underestimate the challenges winemakers face or the incredible like critical thinking skills they have. Okay, that's my soapbox. Um, let's get back to it. So you may recall the, oh boy, um, the white wine flow chart here. Um, but once we're in the winery making red wine, we get this flow chart. Um, it's fine, my exam's in a month and I can totally memorize this by then. Oh, well, anyway, right, okay, so let's discuss this. So once the grapes arrive, for some wines, again, they will be sorted by hand or by machine, and for some they won't. Um, and a branch of this is to actually leave the entire bunch intact, and we will come back to that. This video um, may involve a lot of like going backwards and forwards and forwards and backwards, but I want to get through the very basic process first and then discuss the different ways that you can branch off to get like cool effects. Um, so we sort or don't sort the grapes, and then we have a choice whether or not we want to destem. Now we crush. You may recall crushing is just the pressure to, or the pressure required to split the grape so that grape juice begins to flow. This part is hopefully, obviously, um, not optional. <laughs> now with these crushed grapes, you can opt into pre-fermentation maceration. Right, that's a mouthful. Pre-fermentation maceration. Break it down. Fermentation is the part where we get alcohol. Maceration means we leave the grape skins in with the juice. So this is leaving the skins in with the juice pre, before, the fermentation. Okay, actually I forgot, um, with, like, total aside, I wanted to try something, so I bought some grapes. Um, okay, so hand harvesting obviously would be picking these grapes, and machine harvesting is like, yes! So those grapes that fell off, <laughs> um, those are the ones that are, like, machine harvested, right? Because they are ripe enough to fall off of the stems, forgot words for a second, um, and so the machine just like shakes the vines until that happens. So now what we're gonna try doing, this is live by the way, I haven't practiced this at all. Um, I might have to bring the camera down a little. Okay, cool. So I have my grapes and I'm gonna like squish them. I don't think it's working. All right, I might have to do it with my hand. We wanna squish them just enough. Wow, this is harder than I thought it would be. Oh, there we go. I don't know if that like showed up. Okay, yeah. And now this juice that's coming out, this would be the free run juice. And then when we actually like press the grape, yeah, all of this juice, <laughs> my poor textbook, that's the press juice. Um, there's probably like a much more official video by an actual winemaker on this. So uh, I'll find that. Okay, obviously that was just a fun little experiment. Let's, let's get back to it. So in order to um, soak the grapes with the skins, while preventing fermentation, this process must happen at cool temperatures. So sometimes it's called um, cold maceration. Fermentation will naturally take place between approximately 68 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 to 32 degrees Celsius. So we keep the skins and the juice cool or cold and let them soak together and hang out to get like a greater or deeper color flavor extraction. Um, cool. 
<laughs> I guess it's actually literally cool. Okay, my accidental joke's also bad. So now the non-optional step is fermentation. We'll talk about different fermentation vessels in another video because I'm already starting to think this is gonna get long and we might have to skip some things. If you're watching this, you're brilliant and beautiful and I 100% believe you can make it through this video and get at least something out of it. So after the wine has fermented and you have alcohol, you can also do post-fermentation maceration, which is the same idea as pre-fermentation, except of course the wine has already fermented. Um, it will not continue to ferment, that's over. The purpose of this optional step is actually not, it doesn't make the wine more alcoholic, they, that's done. Um, but a lot of winemakers have found that this additional soaking time allows the tannins, remember those compounds that dry out your mouth, to become smoother and more integrated so you don't get this jarring drying sensation like you just, I don't know, got a mouthful of chalk or whatever. Um, now we need to get our actual wine out. So we'll have the free run wine. Again, <laughs> my demonstration, not great. We're just kind of all over the place. Um, but we'll get that free run wine. We also talked about this in the white wine video and then we'll have the press wine that we get from pressing the liquid from the grapes. The thing to remember here is that these are separate liquids. So if the winemaker wants to do like just free run wine, they can. Um, if they want to do just press wine, they can. Of note, while malolactic was optional for white wine at this stage, all red wines undergo some level of malolactic conversion and it happens here. So now you have a mallow converted wine that can essentially be bottled and sent off to sale. You also have the press wine that has undergone mallow and you can bottle that up and send it off for sale. Or you can have lots of optional steps. That 3000 that I mentioned earlier is actually starting to seem uh, very likely. So you can blend the press with the free run, you can mature, you can mature and then blend in other wines, you can mature some and blend it with already matured, you can have the matured and blend it with the fresh, um, you can clarify and stabilize, you can do any combination of these and then you can bottle it up for sale. And actually you can bottle age and then send to sale. Okay. The point of all of these options, from my understanding, is to curate a particular taste and quality. Um, when you blend, press, and free run, you'll get varying levels of like color and tannins, because remember that the tannins come largely from the skins, and press wine will have had more time with the skins. Free run wine is considered like very delicate, while the press wine has like, oomph, technical term, so totally give me on my exam. Um, maturing the wine can allow the development of those tertiary flavors that come from age. And of course, if you're maturing an oak, you get the oak, nights, oak notes like vanilla, baking spice, lots of developing flavors and options here. Okay, I'm thinking um, this was actually a lot. We can address all of the additional steps like over here in these colors in another video. I really do want this channel and these episodes to make you feel more comfortable approaching wine, not less comfortable and um, to hinder any like gatekeeping in the world of wine. This video I feel is really starting to push those limits. Like I would feel like this was pushing limits. Um, so we'll just do a quick recap. Grapes, crush, ferment, free run juice, press juice, mallow, bottle up and sell, blend together and then bottle and sell. Those are the mando steps for getting red wine. That's it. Optional steps include sorting, destemming, pre and post fermentation maceration, and you can do like an either or, we can expand on that in the next video, blending, maturing, other blending, and clarifying and stabilizing. I hope that gives you some notion of the processes, and honestly, I'll look for some more videos to augment these lessons because even if it makes sense conceptually, it's nice to see it in action. In the meantime, I have these two red non-alcoholic wines, for tasting, um, I wanted to give the Geisen Giesen another shot. I felt kind of bad about my reaction um, in the white wine video, and I've seen free a lot, so I suspect it's one of the more widely available. Uh, now, for transparency, if I don't like this because I haven't tried it yet, I'm still not giving up on the brand. Um, word in the vineyard, get it? Like word on the street. My cat even like was like, no, that's a terrible joke. Um, Word in the Vineyard is that the Sauve Blanc and the Pinot Grigio are actually like the brand's best products, so I'm not opposed to trying them, and I, oh, actually, hold that thought. We'll get, we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay, so trying the free, um, I would call this a medium ruby. It 
but it smells like raisins. And some, okay, there's something else. There's like a wine note here. Not herbaceous, but almost like a, um, like a forest floor light. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. Let's just try it. Okay, I'm already significantly more impressed. There is a notion of tannin. Um, I mean, okay, it is, um, oh, it says somewhere. Dealcoholized premium red wine, grape juice, grape concentrate, natural flavor, sodium benzoate, potassium sorbate, and potassium metabisulfate to protect natural flavor, clarity, and color. Those are all pretty standard. Don't freak out, those are very normal ingredients. It has tannin, which is my favorite part about it so far. And like a, a hint of acidity, like it's thinking about having acidity. It tastes a lot like prune juice at first thought. Not bad. More like uh, Fig Newton, I guess, than prune juice. I would serve this to people if I were having a wine night and they were not drinking. Yeah, okay, let's try this one. Um, this is also a medium ruby. When I poured it at first, I thought it was lighter, but I actually, of course I'm not doing this over a white like I should be, but it is ever so slightly lighter. I get a little more vanilla, as though they were going for an oaky note. Um, oh, okay, this one says it's 20% juice. This one is 6% um, grape juice. This one being the Geisen, uh, Geisen. 6% uh, grape juice, 94% dealkalized prime red wine, or premium red wine, and then uh, sulfur dioxide for a preservative. This also tastes shockingly like wine. There's no heat, obviously, because there's no actual alcohol. But the palate, actually, I, I might like this better than the free. Still a little bit of tannin, not a lot. So if you're looking for something that's going to replicate like a cab stove, we need to keep looking. Um, but I mean, it does just say premium red. That's it. That's the, and the free one is a red blend. So yeah, I would actually say both of these are great alternatives. So my theory that I mentioned just a minute ago was that it has to do with acidity. I'm not really sure... Neither of these are particularly acid, right? Like, I am not salivating at all. I got a little hint of something, um, so I would call this maybe like a medium minus acid. And sometimes I feel like your white wines, I don't wanna say they need the acid more, that doesn't sound quite right. When you don't have acid, wines will feel flat or flabby, or they just feel wrong. Um, we call it the backbone of the wine or the structure of the wine is what the acid does. And I think that's what was really missing in the sparkling. So I grabbed the Riesling to try for the next video. Um, and we'll see how that is. But honestly, these I'm, I'm pretty impressed with these reds. So cheers, and I'll see you next time. And we'll talk about how these wines don't have alcohol in them.